I was working in New York in the early um, 1980s and mid 1980s uh, uh, at the Japan Society and had come to know many, many of the top artists from Japan who were living and working in New York at that time. This included Yoko Ono, Arakawa, On Kawada, uh, and many, many others, including um, you know uh, musicians as well. And all of them spoke with, with reverence about Yayoi Kusama. I went to Tokyo in the mid 1980s and at the Fuji TV gallery saw a fantastic exhibition of Kusama, which also had um, a catalog which was illustrating her shows in New York and in Venice and in Amsterdam, I realized that this was an artist who needed a story to be told. We were the first to go through Kusama's archives, which at the time were stuffed into shoe boxes and hat boxes and suitcases. And luckily for the world, Kusama was an inveterate uh, uh, photographer. She chronicled everything she did. So uh, with this amazing archive, uh, we uh, created what became the standard and uh, uh, bibliography for Kusama, for other scholars moving forward, and the chronology of her life and events um, and exhibition history and performance history. And I was very young. I was a very young curator at the time. But my goal was to really place Kusama in an international history and to argue for her radical innovation across many different art movements. Um, we have to remember also 19... 89 was a pivotal year. It was the year of Magicien de la Terre. It was the year of the uh, No U-Turn show in Beijing in um, February of that year. It was the year of the Tiananmen uprising. It was the year when uh, that is now internationally recognized as a turning point for the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the era of globalization. And uh, art historically, many, many curators were beginning to work around the world uh, to question the Western canon and question the exclusion racial and gender-based exclusion uh, of the canon of modern and contemporary art. And Kusama suddenly was seen in a new light in terms of her unique and importance as an artist for our understanding of what the possibilities for a global art history can be. What comes to mind when I think of Kusama is actually not any one single work or any single series, but the abundance and capaciousness and courage and really genius of all of her life. I think the, the beauty of Gropius Bass's show is to really contemplate the extraordinary journey that Kusama has taken from really the late 1940s until today when she is still very active and the expression of this inner vision that she has even with something as simple as the polka dot which she describes as the fundamental unit of the universe and of a person in the universe uh, that the language that she uses around that single um, element in her art has also changed and evolved over the decades. But as she returns to it now in her later years, her language and her poetry and, and the paintings of the you know, most recent series uh, really has become completely cosmic, has become very transcendental. And I think that energy of Kusama's, that unstoppable, complete obsession to the exclusion of any basic normal life um, is what becomes most 
impressive uh, when we look at Kusama's uh, art and life. You know, she aroused her own controversy um, because she repelled being labeled Japanese. She repelled being labeled uh, a woman artist. She was by definition, a controversial artist. She did not conform to any of the expectations. New York in the 1960s was a far more international art world than we later um, uh, kind of uh, described it to be, but it was still a very conservative male dominated art world. Kusama, frankly, couldn't give a shit. She continued to fight, to campaign, to make art that in itself was more and more outrageous. Simply using the phallus and using the word phallus feel in her um, installation work of soft sculpture or accumulation sculpture of the early 60s and forward was such an affront, was itself very controversial. She sought to challenge the established expectations of women and of Japanese artists, and frankly, even of contemporary artists. Kusama also doesn't see it as controversy. She doesn't willfully seek controversy. She is an authentic artist. She seeks authenticity and completely believes in herself. And that inner spirit and her commitment to her own authentic drive results in controversy. Well, I again, I think going back to the early 1990s when Kusama appeared on uh, the internet international stage through the Sika show and later uh, the Venice Biennial of 1993, it was an era of globalization. It was the beginning of the era of uh, global art history. So I think that there was a lot of writing on Kusama during the 90s um, and she became a great hero, a great icon for women around the world. Um, and then I think uh, just sort of coincidentally, um, we have more recently entered the selfie era. We've entered a period where the public wants experiential art, where public wants immersive uh, kinds of art, where the public seeks an art that you kind of forget yourself in. Kusama was making that kind of art going back to the 1950s. She was one of the first artists to create environmental art and to invite the uh, a visitor into a work of art where he or she becomes an extension of the work of art and is their image can be refracted a million ways in, for example, these early infinity mirrored rooms going back to the mid 1960s. They became immensely popular uh, also as, as images that circulated in social media. She didn't seek that. Again, it's like controversy. She didn't seek that, but the nature of her art predicted what the art world became. Kusama's art has always been way ahead of the trends that follow. I just want to thank her for offering so much inspiration inspiration uh, and challenge to me as a curator and scholar over now 30 years. And I want to congratulate her for being Kusama and for her vision, her courage, her triumph, and for the power of her art.